Welcome to Unapologetically Sensitive, where you can learn, relate, laugh, and maybe even live a bolder, brighter life. I'm your host, Patricia Young. This is a weekly podcast where we explore the strengths we have because of our sensitivity and some of the challenges it poses as well. The information in this podcast is not a substitute for help from a licensed mental health professional. Hey there. To the creatives, healers, sensitives, and deep thinkers, how the heck are you? We are almost September. Very, very close. This episode with Jen, we talk about some things that are going on in my life that are just annoying and frustrating. They're things that everybody has to deal with, trying to get prescriptions from a new doctor, problems with the DMV, things that are very, very relatable. Having doctors talk to you about things that you're saying you're not willing to, to do or change. How do you navigate that? How do you regulate? How do you set boundaries? How do you learn to have a voice? I think these things are very, very relatable, how we perceive, how we want other people to perceive us. So I think you're going to love this episode. And then at the end, Jen and I talk about where we're at with our friendship and our relationship and some changes. And I am so grateful for the healing work that I've been able to do on my own. Jen's doing her own work and then how much healing work we do in the relationship. I just think this is a great episode. So I think that's all I'm going to say. And now, on to the show. Hey, Jen. Hi, Patricia. How are you? I'm doing okay today. Yeah? You know, looking at my relationship with my time management skills. How's it going? (laughs) Well, it's enlightening once I start to ponder it. And so I'm walking a little bit of a razor's edge between despair that I'm so bad at it and Mm -hmm. hope that there's things that can be done about it. (laughs) I like that. I like that. (laughs) So I could go into either either side at any moment, but uh, on the whole, I'm an optimist. So Sounds good. (laughs) How about you, my friend? I think I'm okay. I think I get so into what I'm doing that to stop and pull back, I think I'm okay. I've been very, very tasky, really, since I came out to see you, and it's been a couple weeks now. Well, I think it's only been a week and a couple of days. I finally finished my suitcase and put it away. I'm usually pretty good about unpacking and putting it away, but because I got in so late, I've just been pulling things out of there <laughs> till this I morning. I can give you I... a couple of guesses as to whether or not I've <laughs> unpacked my bag from the mountain trip. I know, but you and I are very different and our lives are very different and how we live <laughs> is very different. So <laughs> It's all good. It's all good. But I've been very tasky, but I'm bumping up against challenges and I totally lost my shirt on Monday. And I've really been thinking about this idea of rigidity and control. I think this is relatable to everybody. And then I'm kind of wondering about this in terms of my autism and not knowing I was autistic 30 years ago when I started working with a therapist and really had a lot of rigidity and have been able to work on that through the years. And just wondering, where would I be today if I hadn't worked with that therapist and hadn't done the work that I have done? Because that automatic pull to get rigid and upset about things is still there. I just feel like I manage it differently, except on Monday when I, I just had a meltdown. And I'm, and I'm okay with that. You know what? I think these days I'm a little bit of a fan of meltdowns if they're done, <laughs> if they're done responsibly, mm-hmm. right? Like, I mean, I, I know you're going to tell a little bit about this story, so maybe I'll hold my comment until then. But I think that sometimes we just got to howl. Yeah. Yeah. And it's kind of nice when we were on vacation, I got a chance to see you allow your kids to have whatever feelings came up in the moment and to work through them and to not have to suppress them. You know, no shade to my mom, but I had to go to my room when I had feelings. And I often sent my kids to their rooms when they had feelings because that's what I learned because I didn't know what to do about it. It's not something I recommend, but I saw so much allowing when I was with you and your kids and things that would come up and then they just move through it and they feel okay about what goes on. They don't have shame around it. There may have been some actual howling that week. There was. There was. <laughs> but it's done <laughs> responsibly, right? It's not splashed at anyone. It's just you're human and we need to howl. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Howl. All right. So we'll talk about the DMV, which I'm sure anybody can relate to. And then <laughs> I started with a new medical practitioner And it's just been bringing up stuff. And I I think this is important to talk about because I know that I'm not the only person and I've just gotten a lot of support around this. So the first thing is the DMV. I thought my license was up for renewal this year, but it's actually not due until 2027. 
but because of the new California Real ID, I need to get it done. And I thought it had to be done before my birthday. I swear to you, it has taken me two weeks to just muck through the DMV stuff. And for some reason, I had to take an online test. And then every time I log back in, I have to re-enter all the same information. And then they want me to upload documents. And then I do. And then it tells me that it's not what they need, but it won't tell me what's wrong with them if they're not clear, if it's the wrong document. So then I have to delete, you know, and then I have to wait 24 hours for them to tell me if it's okay or not. And then I finally got through and I went to schedule an appointment and then it wouldn't allow me to schedule the appointment. But moving back to getting these documents, I don't put my middle name on very many things because it's nobody's business and people can get your stuff and I just choose not to. So not very many things have my middle name and my middle name needs to be on one of these documents. The other thing that happened is I used to do all the bills in the house and it got to be too overwhelming. So Steve does it, but almost all of the bills are in his name. And so anything that I do have my name on doesn't have my full middle name or it's in his name. And I like paper bills because I like touching things and he likes doing things electronically. So as my frustration is building on Monday when I'm trying to just get this stuff done and I've been working on this for a few weeks now, it's crazy. I also had a meltdown about why aren't things in my name? Why is it my name on things? And why isn't my full name on things? And then I, <laughs> I mean, when I get upset, I don't yell at him, but I say, I'm really angry. I'm not angry at you. And then, you know, I just need you to listen to me. This is also about the patriarchy. Why is it okay that everything's in your name? Why would it not occur to you to put things in my name? Why didn't I make sure that things were in my name? And Steve was very gracious about it, but I really got upset. And then I think he just wants to help. And on Mondays, I water this plant that's in my room and I was taking it to bring it to the kitchen to water it. My suitcase was still on a table in the hallway and he went to take it from me and the leaves from the plant got caught on a part of the suitcase. And like, I just screamed at the top of my lungs, like, stop. <laughs> And I'm already activated. I'm already upset. And, you know, my head is like, and now he's ruining my plant. Mm. And, you know, he just doesn't know what to do when it's not common that I get this dysregulated. And I apologize probably 50 times that day and especially that night. So I'm so sorry. It was not OK how I treated you. And he's like, it's fine. It hardly ever happens. I don't call him names. I don't yell at him. But I just got really, really upset. And it's it's human, Very. but it also doesn't feel good when that happens. And then I tried to make this appointment. I finally got through everything and made this appointment. I can't tell you how many times, bless his heart, he, he sits with me because I get so upset when things are challenging. He sits with me so I can clear off papers on my desk, which we did one day this week. And now I love being in my office. So he's wonderful and kind and sweet. And oh, man, it was just <laughs> frustrating. Mm. Yes, very human, right? To have this needing to discharge. Yeah. You know, it's so funny as you're talking, like I'm thinking about how, what a big fan I've become recently of having feelings without the story. Because mm. I think we're so dedicated to like being able to explain things that sometimes we wait, we wait to let the howl out until there's something like the plant getting caught because that like whatever air quotes like makes mm -hmm. sense as opposed to just needing to howl. Mm -hmm. I, I know this morning I howled. It was a time crunch. I was trying to get my daughter off to camp and I was really irritated about something that had happened the week before related to her getting picked up in the morning. And I ended up my ice cube tray. I have to make my own ice cubes in my upstairs refrigerator. Mm -hmm. So the ice cube tray came out. I went all over the floor and I'm like, <laughs> you know, and she's in the other room like, mom, what's wrong? And I waited until that moment to have this big discharge. And I also mm -hmm. think like if you've ever seen Brene Brown's video about why we blame, mm -hmm. it's because it, there's a little mini dissertation in there of why that's then OK to have your howl at someone whose fault, which gives you this illusion of certainty and everything else. Instead of just howling, mm -hmm. because you know what? Life is really frustrating. Everything you were just describing, like started making my heart rate go up. Mm hmm. I can feel it. In fact, on the trip, I had one of those moments too where someone was telling me, but just log into the internet and I couldn't. Mm -hmm. And I, I like totally lost my shirt in that moment. I remember that. <laughs> you, just need to, <laughs> you just need to howl. Yeah. And like, like feral, feral 
discharge of energy that if I keep it inside, my heart rate's going to go up. It's not going to be good for my body. Yeah. And you just want to be like, ah. Well, and it's hard because it's it's not acceptable. And our neighbor across the street, I opened the window this morning. I closed it for recording. But we have a neighbor that they're teachers and they have kids, but they do house swaps or they rent their house off so they can travel when they're not in school. And there's a young child that was screaming at the top of her lungs this morning for a really long time. Part of me honestly wondered if it was a child. It sounded like a child having a meltdown. That's what it sounded like. And I'm thinking if the child's autistic, I get meltdowns. And it was really challenging to listen to. Sure. And how do we do that where it's socially acceptable? Because part of me had tremendous compassion for this little screamer this morning. And part of it was just annoying and was wondering, is it going to interfere with our recording, with my clients? You know, all of those things. Yeah. Well, and also if we're kind of brought up with like, that's not allowed Mm -hmm. and where we've been denied the full expression of the full range of human emotions fully when someone else is having at it, whether this is other children or even our own children, once we become parents, it's like, Mm -hmm wait, something's wrong. Like it's, it's funny how those internalized messages often unexamined, you know, are just with us. Right. Right. Maybe I should have gone over there and offered to howl with her. (laughs) I would have felt better. (laughs) And you know what? It's like, what is that parenting saying? Like connections more important than calm. Mm -hmm. Like I love howling together because we're often both just frustrated and if we get deep into the story of why we're mad at each other, that's so corrosive when really mm-hmm. we're just having a human experience where we yeah. just need to howl. Yeah. Yeah. So the other thing that's going on, and I think this also contributed to my upset on Monday, is I've had an integrative doc for a couple of years. And in December, they stopped accepting insurance. And so it meant that I needed to find a new provider that takes my insurance. And this is big girl stuff that's challenging for me. And I put it off until I was going to run out of prescriptions. Mm -hmm. And then it took over a month to get an appointment. So Monday, I had an appointment with a new provider, a resident through a provider here, you know, a big provider here in San Diego. And I went in, I've historically gotten lots of feedback from doctors about my weight because I, I have a fat body and my cholesterol tends to be high and I refuse to be weighed. The last doctor I refused to be weighed, I happened to tell them what my weight was and then when I logged into the portal, it was right there. <laughs> so I'm like, not gonna get, and, and I wrote them letters about this, about I have an eating disorder, this is triggering. They never took it down. So anyways, I had this new doctor, so I was prepared for standing my ground around this and there was no issue, but what I was not prepared for was because I tend to have high cholesterol, her talking about me going on statins and the consequences of having a heart attack. And what I suspect is the first time she asked about it, told me the consequences, and then she circled back to make sure that she provided education. And I'm clear that I'm not going on statins. And the way that I store information in my brain, and I shared this with her because she said, why? There are areas where I love details and love information, and there are areas where it's too much. So if I read something and the outcome is statins are not for me, it goes in a file that says, no. (laughs) The details, I don't store them because it doesn't Mm -hmm. serve me. I just know that there's a lot of pieces of paper in there that say no. So when she asked me to explain why I couldn't give her any information, and I know at least twice we had this conversation and I said, you know, I get that you have to explain it. And then of course, because she's a resident, she has to leave and then go get the physician and the physician has to come in. Fortunately, in the meantime, soup Jean, (laughs) who we love, (laughs) I texted her and she said, you can get a CT of your heart to see if there's any blockage. And that sounded agreeable to me. So when the doctor came in, he talked about doing a CT of my heart and I'm like, I'm all over that. But it was interesting, even the way that he posed it is, if you get a CT, will you go on statins? And what he explained to me was, if there's anything like 0% is what we want. If there's anything above zero, we want you to go on meds. If it's over 100, that means that there's a pretty severe blockage. And I said, if it's over 100, I will definitely consider going on statins. If it's in between, I don't know. So I said, I want to be very clear about this. But again, he had to reiterate about me having a heart attack and the risks. And I found myself getting dysregulated. I was consciously aware of rubbing my thumb on my finger, trying to soothe myself. And it's funny, my right leg, I got a muscle cramp because I think it was just upsetting to me. I was feeling badgered. 
And I wasn't expecting this. And then the other thing that happened is there's a compounded medication that I take and they were telling me that I should go off of it. And again, I stored, I said, well, what about this and that? And they were very dismissive. And again, I, I didn't have rationale and I sort of felt like I'm feeling bullied about what I know works for me. So we get through it. I'm very, very low on this compounded medication. I brought all my medications in. I wrote down everything I needed. I brought my most recent lab work. I wrote down what my concerns were. I wrote down the referrals that I needed. Like I really was as prepared as I could be for this visit. And I explained that I need this compounded medication right away. So I go home and I, they say they put it in. I call the pharmacy. It's not in. I wait until the next day and I call at two in the afternoon. The pharmacy still hasn't gotten it. So I put in on my health record for the doctor. I put in a note saying it's not in. This is really important. I call the doctor's office. They say it hasn't been signed yet. Great. Mm. (laughs) And then today I had to go back to the same building to get blood work done. I thought as long as I'm here, I'm going to stop by the office and check on it. And they told me it was in process. I called the pharmacy. They haven't received anything. And so I was very polite, but said, I'm very concerned. I'm about to run out. This is an important medication. You know, if you can prioritize this, I'd really appreciate it. I get home and the doctor's office calls and says that the paperwork was signed. It hadn't even been signed since Monday and it's Wednesday and it was put into the pharmacy. So I thought, I don't want to bother the pharmacy because they said they'll call me when they get the prescription. But I waited about 30 minutes and I called and I said, I, I don't mean to be annoying. They said that they got the prescription, but they added something else to it that I taken a separate pill. So that's not going to work. They changed it. (laughs) And so they had to fax the doctor's office back to ask them to correct it. And again, I stayed calm, but I start getting annoyed, like things that are incompetent, they're not doing what they need to do. And then me feeling apologetic to the pharmacy for, quote, being annoying, but it's my job to stay on top of this and I'm not doing anything wrong. And if the doctor's office had gotten it right on Monday, we wouldn't be here. And they usually mail it to me and it's Wednesday. So if they don't get it by today, then I'm going to have to go and drive and pick it up. And I don't even know where I've been taking this medication since 2016. They always send it to me. So I call the doctor's office back, (laughs) (laughs) explain the situation. They said that they would prioritize it. But just having to trust and thinking like, if I don't get the medication, is that okay? And then bless Jean's heart, she sent me some articles about the stuff that the doctors were talking about so that I can bring them factual information. And I'm so grateful. Oh, so when I left the doctor's office on Monday, I got down to the parking structure and I've told you about my verbal stim of going, burp, burp. Mm-hmm. You could hear me in the entire parking lot from the time I got off the elevator till I got to my car. I talked to Jean in my car. She said, screaming in your car is good. I'm like, well, I've got two blocks till I get home, so I'm going to need to hang up. And I got off and I just screamed at the top of my lungs in my car. And even today, it was a very pleasant experience getting the labs drawn. And everybody I've spoken to is fine, but just getting this prescription handled. So again, I got out of the elevator in the parking structure and you could hear me. (laughs) You know, for me, I'm grateful because I was really raised to not make noise, to stay still, to make eye contact, all of those things and the freedom that I'm allowing myself now and not making eye contact and to move my body. And I was thinking, how could I do it differently at the doctor next time? And I'm not going to disclose that I'm autistic because I don't trust that they know what that means. And I'm not, I'm having a hard enough just managing my care with them not having that information that to have another misunderstanding. And I think one of the frustrations that I have with Western medicine is they're convinced that this is the only way to go. And the reality is there are lots of ways that we can treat things. And what I appreciate about Gene is with this compounded medication, the fear is that I can get cancer in other parts of my body. And there are genetic tests that you can take that show the risks of getting those cancers. So you decide which is the best course of action for you. Did the doctor share any of this? Of course not. So having this concept of I go to the doctor to be taken care of and to trust and have them be the experts. And in this case with Western medicine, it's not doing that. So I'm really trying to figure out how to advocate for myself, how to have a conversation in the future about as my physician, you can inform me about things but once. We're not going to go over it more than once. And if I've said no, then that has to be the limit. There also is an integrative practice with this group. And so I stopped by today to find out what's the criteria I need to get a referral. So I need to follow up. 
But part of this is just deciding how do I want to manage my care and I need to call the pharmacy back this afternoon to see if they got the prescription, the bloody prescription. Mm. <laughs> my goodness. I'm angry on your behalf. It's frustrating. So frustrating. You know, one of the things that you said about this idea about you being annoying when really what you're trying to do is navigate a super difficult system. Mm -hmm. And it is really difficult. I mean, I realize that the doctors are sort of impinged upon by insurance companies and I don't know, it's well, we've got, we know we've got a very broken system. Yeah. And this is, I think, part of the fallout from all of that. I mean, yeah. Oh gosh. I have so many different things I want to say right now about the individual and knowing what works for you and, and customizing care. And then when we get into these like research and who funds research and what does the research actually say? And, mm -hmm. you know, anytime that you're working with an averages, you're losing information, which is what diversity needs is like ranges, not averages, which is sort of boils everything down to some sort of ideal midpoint, which is really a lie. Right. It can be used as good information. I'm not saying it's worthless, but I think we have to acknowledge what we're losing in right. specificity. And then right. when it comes down to it being your care, you have every right to be as specific and informed. And we don't want to feel like we're going to battle. Like when we go to our <laughs> doctors, right. you know, and I'm even just thinking about myself. Like I need to find a new one. The last interaction I had was not a good one. Remember and, that. And, you know, I have a stressed out. She's a younger doc and my heart kind of goes out for her too. But I'm like, no, like my my job is to advocate for myself. I mean, this is like this shows up everywhere right now with our boundaries and like we're not responsible for the fallout. Even the pharmacist being annoyed is not your issue, right? Your issue right. and you're you're focused on what you need to be focused on and it's not happening. And so yeah, you are gonna have to get right back in there and advocate for yourself. And if someone doesn't like it or is annoyed or wants to pitch a fit. We have to deal with how it lands in us right? to have someone, you know, kind of melt down in front of us, which happens. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes we're the person melting down. Sure. <laughs> and, there, and this goes back to there just not being space to have the full range of human emotions fully. And everything is like we catastrophize that big time in ourselves and others. Oh, my goodness, Patricia. There's right. so much here. Well, and two things. If you are a woman and you are fat, so... Body positivity doesn't use the word overweight. I don't know which word to use. I'm just going to say fat. Not until the 90s did drug companies start researching on women. They didn't want to because of our hormones, because of being pregnant. And most of the research on drugs is not done on women. That's the first thing. There are research studies that show that being fat can be a protective issue health-wise. And somebody can be living in a body that's an average size the doctor won't say anything to them and they can be incredibly unhealthy. And I have friends that are on the very thin side and have had problems with joints and bones. Doctor doesn't say anything about their weight to them. But if you are carrying more weight on your body and you have any problems with your backs or your joints, the doctor is going to tell you to lose weight. And I re recall that the last doctor that I had with this integrative practice, I went in and said, do you hold the belief that somebody can carry extra weight and still be healthy? Because I'm very fit. I'm very active. My food is questionable. But there are people that can be living in an average size body and be way more unhealthy and less active than I am. And there's a bias there. And for so many years, I thought that was my fault. And I just don't want that to happen anymore. And I really want to work collaboratively with a medical practitioner. And then the second thing is, while this has been annoying and frustrating, it's a system that's broken and having compassion, but continuing to do what I need to do to make sure that I get my needs met. And I think historically, I would have been like, I don't want to bug them. I don't want to be that person. They're not going to like me. And it's like their job is to get the prescription and to get it correctly so that I can have it. And until that happens, my job is to continue to follow up and to be, for me, to be as kind as I can be. I have expressed a number of times just because I'm having, you know, to the pharmacist, just because I'm having a crisis doesn't mean you're having a crisis, but I want to make sure we get this resolved. People have been very nice. And so for me, trying to stay grounded and not go into catastrophic thinking and the worst thing that happens is I don't get my prescription and maybe I'll be uncomfortable for a couple of days and it will validate why I need to be on it. 
So again, Mm -hmm. taking that catastrophic thinking out of it as well. And what I know about myself is I like to be prepared. I like to make sure that I don't run out of things, that this is how my self-care works and how I'm wired. And I couldn't get this filled because I couldn't get in to see the doctor until I got in to see the doctor. So sometimes this is just how things are. So how can we hold compassion for ourselves and everybody else as opposed to walking around talking about how incompetent they are and feeling angry and becoming unpleasant for myself and for other people, which that doesn't work for me in general. No, descending into that kind of bitterness doesn't work for me either. I mean, although it can be helpful to fuel us into standing up for ourselves, but this is, again, it's the context, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's really appreciating the larger context because humans are basically good and basically want to get along unless you come across, you know, there's a real rotten one every once in a while, but And there are systems that are weighing on us. And it's so funny. I was thinking like how much has the, I don't know what even to call it as an industry, the let's just call it the narrow beauty ideal BS industry, whether Mm -hmm. that's, again, this is no judgment on any individual's decision or what they like or want to identify with. But, you know, we've got cosmetics telling us we don't look good until this. We've got the diet industry is a gazillion dollar industry that you can mm-hmm. resell to people because they know the outcomes are so poor. And yet those industries do their own type of quote unquote research, often funded by people who have vested interests and mm-hmm. research coming out a certain way. And I am just really curious how much that has leaked into like the medical research and medical things. Mm -hmm. You know, I know from my little scope of the world here, there are some things that the people selling private practice clinicians, such as myself, marketing that I have seen seep into clinical care. And it makes me nuts. It's a pet Mm -hmm. peeve of mine, right? I don't know that I want to go into specifics about it right now, but I've just, I've seen it, right? I've seen a Mm -hmm. term that's used when you're trying to come up with your marketing copy then applied clinically to your clients. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, that my brain just exploded. I got so, ang- you know, I got very upset because it's inappropriate. So I'm wondering in other fields, like what the bleed, bleeding into in, in ways that if we're not, you know, being critical is a good thing. Yeah, yeah. And part of what is important for us is to have a view that I have a right to be here. I have a right to take up space. I have a right to ask for what I want. And to be really mindful about that narrative. And it, it did creep out a little bit in that, you know, saying to the pharmacist, I'm sorry, I don't want to be annoying. And, I, and I'm okay with that. And this reminds me of something else that we touched on in one of our most recent episodes that I decided to end a relationship with someone and was very clear and stayed in it and really tried to communicate. And then they reached out to me, I don't know, it had been some time later, asking to understand what happened. And you and I talked about this and I drafted a letter to them, an email, and didn't finish it and let it sit. And it was a very compassionate email. And you and I had talked about that I don't have to respond. And this ties back into this idea of how do I want other people to see myself because I'm having this gremlin around, but I'm someone who responds to people and I'm kind. And I, you know, how could I not respond to someone? And in their email, they said, you know, you don't have to respond to this. And my sense is, even though what I wrote was very compassionate, I basically reiterated what I very, very, very clearly laid out numerous times. But the gremlin is, I don't want to be that person that doesn't respond. And the best self-care for me, I'm pretty sure, is to just let it go, to bless it and let it go. But I think this also gets in our way when we want to set boundaries or when we want to not engage of, What are people going to think of me? How does this affect? I'm not the type of person who doesn't respond. I'm respectful. I'm kind. And if you were assigned female at birth, we got so many messages around, don't make other people uncomfortable and be polite and be kind. And if we stand up for ourselves, we're being itchy or aggressive. And at almost 60 years old, I really want to step into who I am and stop tippy-toeing around and apologizing. And when we have these high levels of empathy and can see things from other people's point of view, we often allow others to feel comfortable over our own discomfort because that is very familiar. Yeah. I had a client put it beautifully recently. She just said, 
I'm comfortable making myself uncomfortable to make others comfortable. And mm-hmm. I was like, oof. <laughs> yeah. I was like, that is a, yeah, it's a very relatable statement. And I love the idea that like it depends and the context is important. I went through my own really deep wrangling with this sense of my self-concept and what mm-hmm. it means to be me uh, with a, you know, a close person in my life that in our family circle at one time or another has been estranged from everybody except for me. Mm-hmm. And when it was sort of like really becoming apparent that for my own peace and lots of other things, it was a good, good, good cause for me to have some boundaries. But I went into this I don't almost like a self-concept like crisis. Mm -hmm. And that's the ultimate like decontextualizing myself and then judging me versus really being able to appreciate the context and what the other person's doing and what's going on. And then the playing all the games that we play of like, well, if I do this and then that happens, is that all my fault? I'm like, no, (laughs) I'm saying what's okay. What's okay with me? What's not okay with me? There is a wonderful new book out about boundaries that I found and got, I think it's called Set Boundaries, Find Peace. And I, I don't know the author's name off the top of my head, but I can get it to you. And it came the other day. And I, I like, I don't know when this has happened recently where I sat down and read over 100 pages just in one sitting because I was that kind of drawn in. Boundaries are, are really important. And we don't, you kind of have to disengage your full self-concept based on any one because I mean my life kind of stands for itself and if there's this one instance where I really need to do this Mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that you take that one data point right sometimes I'll work with clients on like well what are all the data points here right you know you don't go into uh, Lowe's and buy one grain of sand you buy a whole bag of sand like each grain is a data point right and let that speak for itself right I will put the name of that book and the author in the show notes. So if you're interested in finding that out, I know Nidra Taub has a book out on boundaries. I don't know if that's the same one. I think that's it. Yeah. That sounds, that sounds right. Yeah. She's on Instagram and has some amazing content. She's just as hot as you can get right now. I think it's N-E-E-D-R-A Taub. It may be T-A-A-W-B. I I'll tend find to, it and send it I to tend you. to mess this up. So check the show, <laughs> check the show notes for it. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Jen, we need to wrap up. Is there anything else before we end? Just maybe wanting a collective howl. (laughs) (laughs) But maybe not on the podcast. Yeah. I don't know how to do that where it won't blow people's ears out. But once we stop recording, then I'd be happy to howl with you. And just if you're listening to the podcast and you're in a place where you can howl, I invite you to howl with us. Yes. But I really (laughs) invite everybody to look at, and you may not want to do it. You may not be ready to do it. This may not be for you, but are there areas where you're really working hard to make other people feel comfortable and you have this idea of how you want to be perceived, but it ends up hurting you because you don't want people to be angry at you or, you know, you and I had a conversation and I think we may have talked about this, Jen, but when I was in Philly and asked if I could stay longer, I trusted that you would let me know if that would work for you. And we were talking about another relationship And there were some concerns about, are you going to be unkind? Are you going to hurt somebody's feelings if you state what you need? And what I said to you was, I would be incredibly hurt and it would really breach a sense of trust if I didn't believe that you would be honest with me when I asked for things. Yeah. And I would much rather deal with the feelings of not getting what I want, but knowing that I can fully ask for what I want and trust you than to try and figure out like, is this working? Is this not working? Are you being honest with me? Are you afraid of hurting my feelings? Yep. And I, I don't think we think about it from that perspective because we often have people in our lives that when we set boundaries, they push against it because those are not healthy people. <laughs> yeah, that was really, putting it that way was super helpful. And I again, like if we really had all come up with the idea that having the full range of human emotions fully was not harmful, mm-hmm. then maybe I wouldn't be so frightened about being the source of someone's disappointment which is ultimately not the source, like so much else goes into it, expectations, you know, all kinds of stuff. But in that clear and direct communication, yeah, I should say, I mean, the reason why I sat down and read 100 pages into that book practically the hour it arrived is because I struggle. I struggle Mm -hmm. with this. In some areas you do, in other areas you don't. Same with me. Mm, That's true. Maybe I'm not being generous enough with myself. Yeah. Yeah. 
But in some yeah. areas, woof, it's very hard. Yeah. Just a final note, and then we need to end. I was just reflecting today at how much healing I've done in my relationship with you. For some reason, I've been listening to, especially our most recent podcast, that by the time you hear this, this episode, you will have heard what we've recorded, but they're not released yet because we're four to six weeks ahead of ourselves. I just feel like the quality of our podcasts are getting better. I'm feeling so much more secure in my relationship with you. I'm feeling so much more secure in my relationship with who I am. Looking at, it's like just really growing up, growing mm-hmm. myself up. And man, it is such a good feeling. And I'm so grateful for you and for the work that you're willing to put into our relationship. And I feel like we're reaping amazing benefits from just being so present and doing really hard work in our own lives and together in our relationship. Absolutely. It's been this way, you know, for a number of years now. And I'm really, really thankful for you. And it does have far reaching, far reaching implications. Like it does it's been a way to achieve kind of more of that secure attachment, both within myself and then out in the world. Yeah. And yeah, some really valuable lessons that I'm happy that you've been so dedicated to this platform that we can share. Yeah. Yeah. It's possible, everybody. Hmm. All right. You got to go. I got to go. Have a good day. You too, my dear. Bye. Love you, my friend. Bye. Hey again. So was that relatable? Where do you struggle Where is it hard for you to take care of yourself, to set limits? What is it that you want people to see about you? How is it for you if people see you as not being that way? And people can see us in a way that we don't see ourselves. And for us, learning how to be okay with that, I think is really, really empowering. This year has brought a lot of very uncomfortable lessons, but I'm so glad that I've had them because it really has made me be more okay with people don't have to like me. They don't have to understand me. They don't have to get me. And I'm okay with that. If you heard things today that resonate and you want to work with Jen or me, you can reach out to Jen at Jen at heartfulnessconsulting.com. You can reach out to me at unapologeticallysensitive.com. If you're interested in being with other people who are wired like you, I think that tomorrow the 30th, August 30th, 2023 is the last day to register for the online HSP course. It will start Monday, September 11th, and it's going to go through October 20th. And there's a Monday in there where we're not going to meet. I'm going to limit it to eight members. If you are craving to learn how to communicate, to be around other people that are like you, that honor you, that respect you, that get you, Even as HSPs, we all show up differently, but that commonality. And I've been working with a couple of clients who have taken the online HSP course twice because they wanted that connection. And it's so beautiful to hear how their group is continuing to meet, how they support each other, what they're learning from each other. If you listen to the episode with Kelly Vance, her group is still meeting. And I think it's been almost two years later. I can't guarantee who's going to be in your group. I can't guarantee what kind of connection that you have. But even during the 10 weeks that we meet, just hear other people that experience the same things can be so validating and normalizing and learning new language for communicating and working on boundaries and perfectionism and embracing your emotions and self-care, communication, creating a lifestyle that honors you, mindfulness and self-compassion. I've just been told that these groups have been really transformational for people and being with other people that are wired like you can be so healing and so validating. If you're interested, you can go to my website, unapologeticallysensitive.com. There's an HSP groups page and it has all the information. There are little one minute audio clips. There's a video of some people that have taken the course. There's podcast episodes. There's a description of what we cover each week. You get an email every week that has a video that Jen and I created together about that week's topic. There are questions, some links if you want to get some more information. Everything in the course is optional. You can come in your pajamas. You can be in your bed. You can have your camera off. You can eat your meal if you want. You don't have to participate. I really want this course to be very neurodivergent friendly to meet you where you're at. And some people that are introverts don't share as much. That's okay. There is no expectation for you to show up any way that you feel like you're supposed to in the outside world. This really is a course that honors you and how you show up. I think that's all I have. Remember, 
Sensitivity is nothing to apologize for. You have a right to show up. You have a right to take up space. You have a right to ask for what you want. You have a right for people to not understand you, to not like you, to not appreciate you, to not get you. That's okay. You have a right to speak your peace, and if other people are uncomfortable, that's okay too. You have a right to have joy and happiness to express yourself. I think I forgot to say this. I, I think I did in the episode. Now I can't remember, but when I left the doctor's office in the parking lot, I was stimming. I was, I think I did say it, but that's part of your right. You have a right to howl. You have a right to make noises that make you feel happy, to move your body in ways that release tension, that make you feel joyful. You have a right to be fully you, even if people don't understand it, don't like it, don't get it. I think that's all I have. Have a blessed day. 